Well, it's uh, a pleasure to be uh, presenting today and uh, just echo uh, James's uh, prior comments that uh, it's uh, you know, uh, also very exciting to be uh, presenting uh, with the, the companies that, uh, that uh, of the caliber that are today overviewing their program. So you know, thank you to the organizers uh, for the opportunity to, to present. So my presentation, I will be making uh, forward-looking statements, so they should be treated as uh, at-risk statements. Uh, Anticense Therapeutics has a market capitalisation of uh, uh, $40 million. We have uh, cash in the bank uh, as of uh, 30th of June at uh, $4 million. So with an enterprise value of around $36 million. Uh, top 40 holders own roughly half the company. Uh, we have three uh, substantial shareholders. Uh, two of those are leading uh, institutional investors in Australian healthcare. That's uh, Australian Ethical Investment and uh, Platinum Asset Management. We're very pleased to have their long-term and ongoing support. We think this provides a very uh, important uh, validation for the business uh, 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 value uh, proposition, value creation proposition of Anisense Therapeutics. The company is based in uh, Melbourne. As the company's name suggests, we are focused on developing our pipeline of Anisense Therapeutics. Uh, we're looking really to focus that development on uh, diseases where there's a clear need for an improved therapies and where our Anisense uh, therapies have the opportunity to be best in class for treating those those indications. Uh, we have two antisense drugs, we call them AT1101 and AT1102. Uh, both of these drugs have uh, successfully completed multiple phase two clinical trials. So we have by any uh, comparison, a very advanced or mature stage clinical pipeline. And as a consequence, you know, significantly de-risked by uh, the, um, by how much data that we've uh, generated successfully on these, on these compounds. Uh, in my presentation today, uh, we'll focus on AT1102 program in Duchenne's muscular dystrophy. We recently reported uh, very uh, encouraging data from a phase two clinical study that we ran at the Royal Children's Hospital in Melbourne. And uh, I'll go through that, uh, that data in, in more detail. That's positioned us now to move into uh, a phase 2B clinical study that we have in mind to run in Europe, which could uh, potentially be a, a pivotal or uh, a, an approvable uh, study in Europe. But I'll just uh, mention briefly our other drug, AT1103. It's for a rare abnormal growth disorder called acromegaly. Uh, we've completed uh, now two successful phase 2 clinical trials. Next stage of development for that drug would be a, a registration study. And we'd be looking to move that program forward with a partner, so anticipate a, pundit, a partner rather to fund the ongoing development of that drug. And so we have interest in that, uh, in that program from pharmaceutical companies. So looking forward to reporting on the continued successful development of that drug. Slide just outlines uh, the technology. Uh, it is, uh, Antisense is effectively a novel way of making you know, very potent and uh, highly targeted medicines. The, it is a platform technology and that is that you can use this same basic Antisense chemistry to make many Antisense drugs to a broad range of uh, diseases. So, uh, you know, they are um, simply described, though, uh, pieces of chemically modified RNA or DNA uh, that are designed to block the production of uh, targeted disease-causing proteins. And our antisense drugs uh, we have acquired from a company called Ionis Pharmaceuticals. Ionis are acknowledged as the world leader in the field of antisense drug development and commercialization. Uh, they're based in the US, they have a 
market capitalization today of $8 billion. They have now uh, three antisense drugs that have been approved with both US and uh, EU regulatory authorities. They have a, a, thir a further 30 of these antisense drugs in clinical development with uh, some of the biggest pharmaceutical companies in the world. So they have partnerships with Roche, Bayer, Novartis, uh, and uh, Biogen. So we feel very fortunate you know, to have a, a relationship with Ionis where you know, we are partnering on the same technology that some of the biggest pharmaceutical companies in the world are also looking to access from Ionis. Uh, we have worldwide exclusive licenses to our drugs for all disease applications from Ionis. And again, as I said, we feel that we're in a unique position here as a company um, developing uh, drugs for rare diseases in being able to access what is a very mature, well-characterized and uh, seen as being a technology which is going to have a very significant impact on the treatment of uh, human disease. But our focus uh, presently, as I highlighted earlier, is in advancing our compounds in the treatment of rare diseases and our lead program today is in Duchenne's muscular dystrophy. Uh, Duchenne's muscular dystrophy is a devastating muscular uh, wasting disease of boys. It's caused by a uh, mut mutation of a gene in these boys uh, that's re responsible for producing a key protein for muscle function. This protein is called dystrophin. So these boys are unable to make enough of this uh, this protein dystrophin, which leads to uh, inflammation in the muscles and uh, ultimately to the loss of muscle function. So uh, the boys, usually by the time they're around uh, 10 to 12 years of age, will lose the strength and function in the biggest muscles of their body, which is the, the, the uh, muscles of the lower body. So they uh, unfortunately lose the ability to walk and end up being confined to uh, wheelchairs. And then ultimately uh, this disease is 100% fatal. So that all boys with Duchenne's unfortunately will eventually come, succumb to either respiratory or, or cardiac muscle failure. So uh, it's actually quite a, a highly prevalent disease for, you know, for a rare condition. It's the most common fatal genetic disorder affects about 44,000 boys in the Northern Hemisphere. The, the key challenge with the, these boys is to look to slow that progressive loss of muscle function. The only way um, that can be treated today successfully, at least in, in preventing the inflammation, which leads to the loss of muscle strength and function is through the use of high dose corticosteroids uh, these corticosteroids are uh, only moderately effective in, in slowing that disease progression, but are associated with some very significant side effects, including uh, significant weight gain, uh, reduced bone density or osteoporosis, osteoporosis a growth uh, and mental retardation. So, you know, they are a, a therapeutic class that, you know, that does come with some very uh, serious side effects. But, um, but for these boys, you know, they have no alternative because if they're not treated with this therapy, they will, and their uh, loss um, of muscle strength and function will be a lot more rapid. Uh, and so as a consequence, uh, physicians are uh, now uh, recommended to start them, uh, boys on corticosteroid as early as two years of age. So we're looking at a, a, way, a better way of treating the inflammation than using uh, these corticosteroid drugs, which were first approved over 60 years ago. So there's definitely um, a need for better, better therapies to, to treat this inflammation. Our antisense drug is designed uh, to block a protein that's known to be involved in the inflammatory process. It's a, uh, a receptor that uh, is on the surface of blood lymphocytes or immune cells. And by blocking the production of this receptor on this lymphocyte, we're stopping the abnormal supply of these lymphocytes into the sites of inflammation where they are causing this, um, 
this extra damage, such as in the muscle tissue of the boys with Duchenne's. And we know uh, boys with Duchenne's, uh, they have immune cells or white blood cells, lymphocytes that have much higher levels of this CD49D on their surface. What we also know is that the corticosteroids have um, no effect on the expression of this uh, receptor, uh, either on the number of receptors on the cells or on the number of cells that express this receptor. So we know we're working through a, a unique mechanism to the corticosteroids, which is the uh, opportunity to be able to use this drug potentially in combination with um, steroids, as we are doing in the clinic presently. But uh, we are the only company in the world today that has a drug in clinical development targeting CD49D. And uh, what we also know is that the boys that are most severe with the disease, the non-ambulant boys, have the greatest number of these CD49D uh, expressing cells. And today, I think there's only one other company that has a uh, program active, clinical uh, program active at the moment in non-ambulant boys. So we're in very uh, rare company in developing a treatment for non-ambulant patients. Uh, so we ran a study at the Royal Children's Hospital in Melbourne. Uh, we dosed uh, non-ambulant boys for six months and we assessed the boys um, the safety of the drug in these boys. We also looked at the drug's effects on disease progression. It's assessed in non-ambulant uh, boys by, by uh, looking at their up limb strength function because after the boys lose the strength and function in their lower body, the next largest muscle group to be impacted are the, the, the uh, shoulders uh, and arms. So uh, we, uh, through the study, are measuring the strength and function of the upper limbs. And we know, uh, and this has been well documented in the literature, that uh, even when boys are on their uh, high doses of steroid, they will see a steady linear loss in both strength and function over that six month period. So we're very pleased to report the drug was well tolerated in the study. We had no uh, patient withdrawals, no serious adverse events. And that you know, we think positions us to be able to dose at higher levels in our follow on study. Uh, very pleasingly, we were able to show that the boys, uh, when we assess their strength, which is by looking at their pinch and grip strength, were uh, able to show stabilization and in fact improvements in grip strength over the, the, the reported significant losses in the literature in, in patients who are non-ambulant uh, also on corticosteroids, like all the boys were on in, uh, our study. Along with the strength improvements, we showed an improvement in, uh, in the muscle function uh, so that we were able to show that seven of the nine boys showed clinically meaningful improvements in their, uh, in their uh, upper limb function scores after the six months of, ter uh, of uh, treatment. Again, comparing that to the acknowledged losses that would be expected with the uh, boys over that time period. And we were able to, very excitingly and, and somewhat surprisingly, because we think we're one of the first to show this in a clinical trial, we are able to show our anti-inflammatory drug preserving the uh, amount of functional muscle mass in these boys, in the, in the muscles of the upper limbs. And we're able to show a stabilization in the percentage of fat in these muscles, which is a marker of disease progression. Whereas at all other studies have shown, even with boys that are on corticosteroid, increases in muscle fat uh, related to the loss or destruction of the muscle tissue. So we're very excited by this data. You can see that we've incorporated in the presentation here a quote from our, uh, one of our key opinion leaders that's been involved in the planning of our next uh, trial. You know, he's pointed to the fact that we've seen consistent positive clinical benefits across multiple parameters as being great encouragement for moving into our next clinical trial. Uh, this slide here updates on the, on the status of, um, of our planning for our next study. Uh, we have in mind to run a phase 2B clinical trial in Europe. Uh, we have sought a scientific advice from independent national authorities and also from uh, the European Medicines Agency on the trial design, getting this feedback before we go into the formal 
application process for the trial. So look to de-risk on our regulatory interactions. We've had very consistent feedback from both the national authorities and the EMA on our trial design plans with great um, encouragement for the uh, key trial parameters that we want to incorporate in the study, including how long we were gonna dose for, uh, the safety monitoring plan, importantly, the efficacy endpoints for the study, which are the same ones that we have already shown benefits on in our phase two study, but also importantly, that this study, should we get uh, positive trial results, could be uh, uh, an opportunity for us to see an early approval for the drug. We're now looking to uh, move forward with an application to the uh, uh, paediatric committee in Europe to confirm our paediatric uh, development plan. This is a requirement in Europe for uh, presenting to the authority your plans for doing studies in boys up to 18 years of age. We're well advanced in those plans, looking to submit our application in the fourth quarter of this year. And uh, we anticipate uh, getting feedback from that application process ahead of submitting our trial application, which we're looking to do in the first half of next year, when we have also now uh, clinical trial supplies uh, online to be received in the, in the same period. So everything um, really running as anticipated on track with that program. And so, you know, we're looking forward to further updates on our progress as we move towards um, trial application approval and, and start of the study. Uh, in parallel, we've been uh, working with uh, key groups in the US on our development path for the drug in uh, the US. We've got, um, uh, active in uh, discussions going with key opinion leaders and advocacy groups in that market. And that, you know, now becomes a priority for, for the company. We know there are fast track or accelerated designations available for companies developing orphan drugs in the US. And as uh, Jared said, we've now submitted our uh, orphan drug designation application in the, in the US, which would, uh, uh, along with the uh, regulatory incentives that the FDA provide, support rare drug development, provide an additional seven years of market exclusivity for the drug um, post approval. Uh, this slide um, outlines the key value uh, creation opportunities that are presenting to us in the near term, including moving H1104 into new inflammatory disease indications, our progress with our US regulatory plans and advocacy interactions, our orphan drug designation, and, and progress with H1103. So we have really um, very exciting near-term catalysts and news flow presenting for the company. Uh, uh, the slide just talks um, to the value creation potential of H1102, looking at a, a relevant uh, comparable story or benchmark uh, company in the US company called Sarepta Therapeutics. In 2016, Sarepta received approval for uh, the, a drug that um, is treating uh, boys with a particular mutation of their dystrophin gene. This um, drug probably effective to, um, or useful for about 13% of boys with, uh, with the disease that recently they got a, a similar approval for the boys that have a mutation of their exon 53 mutation, which represent about 8% of boys with the disease. So effectively addressing about 21, you know, 20% of boys with uh, Duchenne's in the US only. Uh, you know, today, that company has a market capitalization approaching $12 billion, you know, based on revenue of about $100 million in the US alone. And so, you know, we see our antisense drug the addressable market being effectively all boys with Duchenne's because all boys at uh, some point will require treatment of, of their inflammation. And, uh, you know, so we see a very exciting opportunity to, you know, here presenting to us like, you know, um, has been evidenced at, uh, at Sarepta. I have on my board uh, the ex-chairman of Sarepta, Bill Goolsby. I have as my uh, medical director, another ex-director of Sarepta, um, a chap called Gil Price. And so, you know, with their assistance, 
and their experience in being able to grow Sarepta from a, a market capitalization of around kind of where our company is capped today to a $12 billion entity, you know, is, is very exciting, you know, for us to be able to look to exploit their experience and networks and, and, and experience in being able to grow, grow a company focused on Duchenne's. Uh, this slide uh, talks to uh, beyond the market potential in Duchenne's, you know, we see very exciting commercial potential for H1102 and other inflammatory disease settings. The anti-inflammatory market today is valued at over $100 billion. It's one of the biggest therapeutic categories in the pharmaceutical world. And, you know, we think our drug, because of the great data that we've generated in Duchenne's, We've also shown the drug to be active in MS patients, has great application in other diseases where there's a need for improved therapies and where our drug could show important therapeutic benefits. So, you know, again, we think that the market potential for this uh, drug is, is enormous. So last slide, um, just to summarize then on the key features of, of the company, uh, we have uh, two advanced stage uh, clinical uh, drugs that um, have shown to um, be you know, very effective in treating the diseases that we've been uh, assessing them in. And that data has been presented in uh, multiple clinical journals, so validating the data that we've, that we've generated. Uh, we have worldwide exclusive licenses to those drugs from the biggest player in the field in, in Ionis Pharmaceuticals. Uh, we've got a, a program in Duchenne's where we've uh, generated some very exciting uh, preliminary data in patients and advancing rapidly into a phase 2B clinical trial, which could be a, an approvable study for us. So potentially one study away from being able to commercialize our drug in the second biggest pharmaceutical market in the world. And as I said earlier, really exciting potential to expand the use of this drug into other clinical applications of the drug. So being able to jump from you know, where we are today into clinical studies based on the uh, successful preclinical and clinical data that we've generated on antisense uh, to uh, CD49D, our AT1102 drug, um, the, the data that we've already generated to date on that compound to advance us into uh, clinical development in those broader disease settings. So thanks, Jared. I'm happy to take questions. Thanks, Mark, for the presentation. Um, we're running a bit out of time. So um, there's one question that comes in and says that in previous announcements, um, the company have declared that any partner would like to input into the future trials in the 2B DMD. Um, the next stage is the submission from the from advice of the EMA. At, at what point will you inform the market of partner involvement and what would be the capital required to take the 2B for DMD to completion? Sure. So uh, in terms of it, you know, any... Um, in a uh, uh, partnering prospect, in, it would be, you know, when of course those um, those interactions have advanced to a point where they're sufficiently definitive enough, material enough for us to be able to advise the market. So, you know, once you know, or should those discussions advance to that stage, we would we would you know advise the the market as we know we uh, must do. Uh, in terms of the development costs for the for the program. You know, we're still working through the trial design with our interactions with the European regulatory authorities. You know, we think a study like this that could be an approvable study, you know, uh, you know by comparison with uh, other, you know, larger clinical programs will be a very cost effective, uh, you know, cost effective program. And so, you know, in terms of trial costs, it's something that we will look to uh, report on when we get closer to uh, initiating the study. Right, yes. And one last question. So for the non-dilutive uh, funding, right, is it just directed uh, at 1102 for the multiple cirrhosis? No, I think that that, that would present also for our you know, drug in, in acromegaly as well too, but, uh, but also for other disease applications of H1102 in other inflammatory settings. So it really presents for, you know, for, for all applications that we have in mind for our antisense drugs. All right. Thanks, Max, for the wonderful presentation. Um, Thank you.